honor for me to have a few minutes to speak to you and to do some thinking and analysis on a topic that's probably been on all of your minds all week. And that is, of course, uh, Will Smith slapping Chris Rock in the face at the Oscars. I'm joking because there isn't enough time for me to talk about that. Um, later, later afterwards. Honestly, I am actually invited here and it is an honor to just give some thoughts about movement building, about electoral politics, and about policy change as we leave this summit and go, and go back to the places and communities where we all do our work. Uh, so I wanna go through a few things based on what I've been hearing during the summit and what some of my own hopes are uh, or for how we, how we leave here. I really wanna salute uh, Jordan, Jordan who, who came up, Jordan Coe, who came up and spoke to us at the beginning uh, yesterday and talked about food, uh, and talked about fish and deer being exchanged for housing. It set a tone for me, it got my attention, it started getting me thinking and dreaming. When we talk about decolonization, when we talk about what it means to challenge the system that is structured to keep so many people in poverty, that is structured to take indigenous people's land away and to, and to keep that land in, in, in the hands for profit rather than to be in relationship, Jordan brought all of that into focus by saying that that food, that is a gift, that is a service that can be exchanged in the way that money can be exchanged, that we need to start decolonizing and thinking about things that way. And so I really wanna thank Jordan for that very bold idea, which he says, as far as he knows, isn't being practiced anywhere else in this country. And we should be taking ideas like that and really trying to be brave and rethink the way that we think about exchanging of the value of housing and of our relation to land. So that was amazing. Um, yeah. It's also been really nice to hear so many stories um, from the front lines of the struggle in healthcare. My mother is a 71-year-old nurse who's been at a nursing home for almost 30 years now. She's still going. She took a small break for three months during the pandemic. My sister and I begged her not to go back to work, but she said they need me, and she went back. I think that the organizing that's been happening in health services, the organizing during this pandemic has been some of the most powerful work that has been going on, and I wanna salute all of the people who are fighting despite this pandemic that we're going through during the tough times to organize and to be finding the extra energy and the extra time to push. The struggles in healthcare and the organizing that we're seeing in healthcare is truly phenomenal. And I, and I feel like because it affects women, particularly black women, particularly racialized women, immigrant women, this kind of organizing lifts the floor for everybody, wages for everybody, standards of living at work for everybody, and we need to support and uplift that fight. So salute to those folks. Um, we've heard about elections. We have one uh, coming up better, or provincially here in Ontario. There are also going to be municipal elections in Ontario this year. Um, I noticed during the pandemic that there was this moment in Ontario during one of the big COVID waves where we started talking about paid sick leave. And something strange happened where this became multi-partisan, cross-partisan, beyond partisan. And everyone was talking about the need for people to be able to stay home when they are sick, to be able to take breaks from work in general. And in Ontario's context, Doug Ford became so overwhelmed as premier with this demand to do something that he could no longer ignore it. And that's when we know our organizing is really working, is when the political class can't ignore it anymore. <laughs> However, Doug Ford, uh, decided that he was going to basically bring in the minimum to try and shut all of us up and to close the discussion 
on paid sick leave. And what I think is, no matter what province you live in, it is these kinds of issues that I want to see social democrats and people who associate with the left continuing to fight for moving forward. So yes, paid sick leave. Yes, raising social assistance rates in every province where they're inadequate, raising disability rates. During COVID, seeing people get CERB and getting more money on CERB than somebody on disability is getting because of this division where we say that people are more valuable based on their contribution to the economy. Again, going back to what Jordan was saying, right? This kind of challenging to these kinds of policies is good. I hope we'll see it in the upcoming election in Ontario, but I hope we continue to see people organizing and making those issues front and center in campaigns across the country because we need to continue fighting for those things. Um, it's also been really nice to um, hear and see people talking about independent media a lot at this summit. I think that one of the ways that we need to fight back in an increasingly shrinking media landscape and in a corporate media landscape, meaning Bell, Rogers, uh, uh, Shaw, those telecommunications companies didn't get into that business to tell all of you the truth. Right? They're here to do what corporations do. And if they titillate you, if they provoke you, and they can make some money selling ads on the side, they're happy. There's a lot of brilliant journalism being done in the mainstream too. I benefited from citing a whole bunch of it in the work that I do. But the point is that independent media allows us to be free from a lot of the corporate pressures to not talk about a lot of the issues that we absolutely must be talking about. So shout out to Press Progress. <laughs> And shout out to Harbinger Media, shout out to all of the independent people producing podcasts, going out to actions and documenting for us what's happening in their local community so that we can see it. We have to continue to support that kind of work um, as well. Um, I hope you guys were here last night when Shima Robinson was given the award uh, for her work fighting against homelessness and the housing crisis in Edmonton and making such a beautiful acceptance speech and poetry. You blessed us. Thank you so much. And I, I felt like it was quite meaningful to see Olivia Chow, somebody else who's been fighting along those lines for decades to be the one to present that award. And I wanna say that my heart has been broken in the last year seeing in my own city of Toronto, Trinity Bellwoods Park, Lamport Stadium, Alexandra Park, the evictions, the hundreds of militarized, militarized police officers coming in to bulldoze, to throw away, to beat and assault and handcuff and throw to the ground and arrest people for the crime of living outside. But not just in Toronto, in Halifax, in Hamilton, in this city. Take a spin around the block if you'd like to, if you haven't done so when you leave here today. Check out the security, spin in the block, endlessly looking for somebody to harass. Where could that money be going? We're paying people to surveil and oversee homelessness instead of addressing the issue, and we have to do something, fundamentally, if we're gonna talk about campaigning and about policy change, we have to do something about these vagrancy laws, the law that says you can't pitch a tent in a park, the law that says you can't walk through a park after dark, the law that says you can't piss outside even though every store was closed, bathrooms closed during the pandemic and there was nowhere to go. Those kinds of laws ruin people's lives, send people to jail, give them thousands of dollars of fines so that if they do ever get off of the street, they can't move forward with their lives. These laws apply all across this country and we have to get rid of them as part of the fight for housing. Uh, I, I didn't know much about the just transition conversations that were going to be taking place here. I was very interested in them and I wanted to make one remark just in terms of um, how we transition and thinking about it in the context of what's happening internationally right now. A lot of our focus has been on the war uh, in Ukraine right now. And because of the short-term fear 
that that conflict is posing, there is a lot of thinking about, well, do we arm ourselves? Do we up military spending? The Canadian Armed Forces have to be part of this conversation about a just transition too. How are we going to talk about emissions and fossil fuels and not talk about military forces around the world? What are we talking about? So I understand people's considerations in the short term, but what is our long-term vision for peace? For peace, not for armament, not for defense, which means more weapons. What is our long-term vision for peace? And let us not lose sight of that, even though we are living in an incredibly scary time, which didn't start with Ukraine, by the way. I don't have to say that to anybody in this room. A lot of people know me for my work around policing, and I've done a lot of work specifically about the issue of police carding, the stopping and documenting of people by the police, a practice that many will tell you is over because they stopped paying attention to it. I, I would just actually like you, and I get credit sometimes, it's very strange. First of all, I didn't do anything personally to end this practice because it's not over, but it is strange to me how um, people can actually think, like, I just want to take a pulse of the room. Do any of you really believe that the police, the police who are completely out of control in this country, have given up the right to stop us walking down the street and ask us what? Do you really believe that? No, because if you do, I have to disabuse you of the notion that because the practice might have gone underground, because, in, for example, in Ontario or in Alberta, they have made proclamations saying they will no longer do this, don't be fooled. Ask people who are affected by these practices and they will tell you it has only gone underground, but it has never stopped. And I bring up carding and I bring up issues of larger surveillance because we have to, as my friend Aziza Kanji always tries to remind us, we have to tie this to larger issues of like national security in this country, of so-called terrorism. A lot of the Islamophobia that is being fueled in this country is coming from the top down. It's coming from no-fly lists. It's coming from government surveillance programs of Muslim and Arab people. That too is part of the larger conversation about carding and about surveillance. And I never want us to forget in our conversations that we have to fight this on a national level as well. Um, you guys know that I believe very strongly in defunding and abolishing the police. There's been, yeah, you can clap for that. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about the convoy. There's been a lot of conversation about Ottawa and about the exposing of the police for who and what they really are. And you know, we heard earlier about, in this city, trans women on the front lines going out, getting intelligence, getting information, sharing, warning, doing the groundwork. Those people in our society who are already the most oppressed are the ones who feel when things like this happen, like they have to step up because they are directly at threat. And when we give all of our resources to the police and none to our communities, we are making sure that people who are going to go out and do that work don't have the resources and the protection. So what happened in Billingsbridge is a sign that we can get together to combat hatred. We don't have to have an armed paramilitary force come in and do it for us. We have to take charge in our own communities and take back the resources that come with us. That's what we mean when we say defund and abolish the police. Just a couple of final thoughts. One is, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, my friend L. Jones, who's been doing anti-prison work for many, many years, and long before the pandemic, people like L. were reminding us that we need to talk about abolition and defunding in the prison system in this country as well, our prisons and jails. Well, during COVID, something quite miraculous happened. Suddenly, all the calls saying that there were too many people in jail, particularly in remand, meaning they haven't faced trial yet, but they are in jail waiting to do so, that 
this is completely unnecessary and that we could very easily let people out of jail and 10%, 20%, 30% in some cases in different provinces across the country, this happened. Now, it was inadequate because there are no programs, there are no supports. We've just talked about how there's no housing, right? But a crisis forced us to recognize that we are incarcerating far too many people in this country and that all of the fear mongering that tells us that we have to keep doing that for the sake of safety is untrue. So I want us to continue fighting to decarcerate this country, starting with our provincial jails. And that's something that we can do across every province. <laughs> Finally, um, the last chapter in my book is um, called Abdul and Fatuma. Abdul and Fatuma came here as children from Somalia. They were taken from their family into the care of child services in Nova Scotia. And when child services took them, it became their legal guardian. But it did not seek their citizenship. And so Abdul and Fatuma became adults and didn't have citizenship, and neither of them have it to this day. It is a shame. They tried to deport our brother Abdul when he got into contact with the criminal justice system. 50% of uh, people who have been in child welfare end up in contact with the criminal justice system across this country, okay? So they tried to deport Abdul for their own negligence of not seeking out his citizenship and we had to fight that deportation. And since that time, I have met so many other children, now young people, who don't have status because of the exact same problem, that they were taken out of the care of their immigrant parents or guardians but no one cared enough to get their citizenship. Well, Senator Jaffer has introduced legislation to finally address this problem and make sure that this doesn't happen to children anymore. And I really hope that it can get through. I really hope that you will keep your ears open and that you will write letters of support. I'm gonna be making sure that there's a lot more noise about this in the near future. But I wanna say that if we're going to have status in this country, which again, if we're talking about long-term visioning, maybe one day we won't even have to have that. But if we're going to have status, we have to have status for all people in this country. And that means, that means that if you are good enough to come here and go down to Leamington and pick tomatoes, if you are good enough to come here and become a nanny for somebody else's children, if you are good enough to come here and work some of the hardest jobs in this country for some of the lowest pay and job protection, you are good enough to stay and have all of the rights and benefits that others have in this country. And I'm saying that particularly in this room, and I'm ending on this, because the labor movement in this country, the broader labor fight, has to pay attention every day to those people without status and think to themselves that that's the floor that we're going to lift for every one of us. So, I'm just so energized by what I heard in the last session. I'm so energized to be here with all of you it's wonderful to gather, to be among friends, to reflect, to challenge one another, and to dream of what things are gonna happen when we go out of here. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you uh, very much, Alejandra, for that introduction. And uh, it's really hard to follow Desmond Cole. So, <laughs> so I set your expectations a bit lower for me. Um, but I'm really delighted to be here with you. And I'm really delighted to be here with Leah Agazan, who's a good friend and my critic. Uh, but we do get along. Um, and so uh, delighted to be here with her as well. Um, I think I was invited here because of some remarks that I made uh, following um, I guess during the convoy actually in Ottawa. And um, I was sitting in the House of Commons, it was a Wednesday, it was after Prime Minister's uh, question period, and um, there were some remarks made in the House of Commons about the fact that um, 
you know, the, the people on the streets in Ottawa had, uh, you know, demonstrated symbols and attitudes that were associated with hate that were associated with Nazism and um, associated with things that I thought every Canadian could agree uh, were wrong. And Leah and I were sitting in the House of Commons and some of the members of the opposition got up to uh, demand that those comments be retracted. Um, that, you know, and, and that, you know, we shouldn't ever say those things because, you know, don't we all understand that no one in the house supports that. But they kept going and they kept going. And, you know, one of the things that I was sitting there reflecting on, I wasn't going to comment because I thought, you know, I actually just, I don't think we should be having this conversation. I think we should move on. But every time someone stood up to say, clearly we all denounce Nazism, clearly we all denounce these hateful symbols and these hateful acts, I couldn't help but think, well, shouldn't we just assume that's the truth, but how can we assume that's the truth when there are people standing out there that are espousing these values, that are wearing these symbols, that are, you know, completely unacceptable in the society. And so I stood up and asked, first of all, for calm. Second of all, to take a step back and think about what you're saying and think about what you're defending and think about what message that sends. My colleague Greg Fergus, just a few days or a few weeks beforehand, had talked about what, as a black man, seeing those symbols of white supremacy meant to him and what it meant to the people of Ottawa and it meant to people across the country. You know, Leah and I are both descendants of Holocaust survivors, and to hear people compare a vaccine mandate to what Jewish people in the Holocaust had experienced is, is unacceptable and it's unimaginable and, and it just demonstrates why it's so important for us to talk about history and to talk about the truth and to talk about what these things mean and what the reality of these absolutely hateful and horrible situations were and what that meant for people and to equate vaccine mandates with the murder of six million Jews was just unbelievable to me. And I guess where, where I was in that moment and where I continue to be is to know that there are still more people in this country who don't think that way. And that there are people who want us to come together, who want us to be working together to deliver things that make Canadians' lives better, that make a more inclusive, more equal, more equitable society, and that we have to confront these hate, this hateful rhetoric. We have to confront where this is coming from, and we have to understand how we can move forward. There are certainly politicians right now that are saying we are more divided than ever. And for some people, that's true but I don't believe it's true for the majority of Canadians. I actually believe for the majority of Canadians, we have much more that unites us than divides us, but we're actually not as loud as the people who are seeking to divide us. And I think we do have to come together and we have to find that common ground because we cannot allow those who are seeking to divide Canadians, who are seeking to put people down, to um, you know, Desmond was talking about those colonial structures that are seeking to reinforce systems that exclude. We can't allow that to happen. We know better than that. We know better to know that we are stronger and better when we are united and that when we are coming together and when we are lifting people up. We're not going to agree on everything. That's fine. That's normal. That's politics. That's life but we have to change the systems in which we operate to ensure that they are no longer being exclusive of people and they are no longer allowing for that kind of rhetoric, that kind of symbolism to be accepted in our country here in Canada. And for me, that means that we have to stand up and speak up at every opportunity. 
And we have to ensure that we're calling it out, that we're calling it out when someone is saying something that's racist. We're calling it out when someone is saying something that is discriminatory. We're calling it out when someone is standing beside someone and supporting those kinds of actions and behaviors. And then we have to figure out how we move forward together. And we have to figure that out because the systems that we have in place, and certainly I recognize that you know, I have a lot of privilege as a minister of the crown, as uh, you know, a white woman, um, but even with that privilege, the systems that we have in the society are still not designed for someone like me. They're still not designed for people who have, inter in, uh, who have inter different intersectionalities. We still have to push and work together and we have to bring people along on the journey as well. And we have to demonstrate why making those changes is important and why it's going to lift everyone up and why we're gonna be better off, all of us, when we have a society that is truly inclusive, equitable, more equal, and one where everyone feels that they belong. So thank you so much for having me today, and uh, I'm really delighted to have been here. So thank you. All right. So um, I also believe that I was invited to speak here today uh, because of my remarks and thoughts that I had following the Freedom Convoy as well. Um, I would love to see actually a show of hands of those of you in the room who uh, grind your teeth at night. <laughs> Clench your jaw, that's, yeah. I've been doing a lot of that over the past few months and I did a lot of that when the Freedom Convoy was here in Ottawa where I grew up. Um, but I wasn't grinding my teeth at night because of the state of the organized far right. That is familiar to me as a person living and organizing in Alberta. It's not new. I know that the right has been organizing for years. Deeply disaffected fossil fuel workers have been recruited into the far right for years because of our failure to speak to their real material grievances. But I was grinding my teeth at night because of what I think the convoy says about the current state of the left in this country. And I would be incredibly dishonest not to say that there have been moments over the past few days when that fear and apprehension of the direction that we are headed in has not felt um, deeply despairing and hasn't made me clench my jaw and grind my teeth over the past couple of nights as well. What the Freedom Convoy was able to achieve was speaking to people's very real material grievances. It was able to say, the system is rigged. And people know that the system is rigged. They know, they can feel it in their bones. I remember uh, a few weeks after, you know, the, lock the first lockdown was declared. And this Liberal government, they gave rent relief to airplanes at the Toronto Pearson Airport before they gave a cent of rent relief to working people in this country. So with respect to the minister, who I don't know if she's left now, there is division in this country, and there is a division that is needed in this country, but it is the working class against the corporate billionaire class at the very top, and that is a division that we actually do need to exploit, and we need to make it abundantly clear to people in this country, and our failure to do so is what is sending people into the welcoming arms of the far right. And there have been people um, recently who have said, we can't dream too big. We can't go too bold. We can't have, you know, too transformative of a vision. That's not where people are at. And I hear that and I say, we are not living in moderate times. <laughs> it is very clear that we are not living in moderate times. And so why should our vision be moderate? 
that will not reach the scale of the moment and the scale of the crises, the overlapping crises that we are currently facing. We need to be crafting a clear, compelling vision of the world that we are fighting for, one that upholds indigenous rights and sovereignty, one that guarantees good work to any single person in this country who wants a job, including those who are currently without status. And we need to be fighting for dignity and justice for all people in this country. There have been a lot of people and a lot of people in my life who say, we can't talk about racism. We can't talk about white supremacy. We can't talk about indigenous rights and sovereignty because that will divide us and that's a distraction. And we can't afford not to. <laughs> we can't afford not to. Because the billionaire class in this country, Galen Weston, Jim Pattinson, they are the people who benefit when we are turned against one another along lines of race, along lines of ability, along lines of class. And it's up to us to directly confront that and make clear to people that we are stronger when we are united. And the only way that we will be able to defeat those at the very top is by understanding that and bringing people into that narrative and that understanding. One thing I wanna talk about as well, um, I, I'm a climate organizer, so you might be like, what does she have to say about the far right? And that's, you know, fair. There are a lot of, I think, cautionary tales that the climate movement has to offer this space that I think are incredibly important. You know, the climate movement has been incredibly well organized for years. We've seen mass mobilizations, 500,000 people in the streets in Montreal, over a million people across the country out demanding climate justice. And it's been an incredible, uh, an incredible amount of, of narrative power that I think has been built. The vast majority of people in this country now understand that we are in a climate emergency. They get that. They want the government to act. But the point that we're at now is that our government declared a climate emergency one day and they bought a pipeline the next day. The lesson here for all of us is that it's not enough anymore for us to continue to mobilize the people who already agree with us. We know that the Freedom Convoy showed us that mass mobilizations are no longer enough we need to be building real material power. And that's gonna take deep organizing. Deep organizing within the everyday institutions that we belong to. I'm coming to the end of my notes. Um, <laughs> but I hope that for everyone who was watching the Freedom Convoy and who was similarly reeling over what they were seeing, that we are understanding and asking ourselves, what does it say about our movements when the right is doing a better job recruiting our coworkers, our family, and our friends into their own movements than we are into our own? We can no longer afford to come to conferences and incredible events like this and you know, feel really good, and I, I think we should. We have had significant victories and dream together without then going back into our own communities and saying, how often am I talking to my neighbors? How often am I talking to my kids, uh, you know, kids' friends' parents at parent-teacher association meetings? How am I building power in my everyday life and thinking about what are the institutions that I belong to that give me proximity to people who don't yet agree with me? Because that's the work that we need to do, and that is the only thing that's going to defeat the billionaire class in this country and improve our real material conditions. Thank you. So I want to start out by saying this. I'm turning 50 next Friday. Fundraiser to be had, I think. I'm not a very good fundraiser. But I say that because, you know, I was born into the movement. My parents 
My mom uh, grew up in the child welfare system, aged out of care, 18, Marge, you're on your own, became an award-winning psychiatric nurse, social worker, changed legislation, and my father, the only surviving child after the Holocaust, five survivors in total. Can you imagine being the descendant of the only surviving child on both sides of your family? So I grew up in a family that viewed life as a gift and who fueled their struggle and experiences with genocide on two parts of the world. They fueled that energy, that grief, that experience to fight for human rights for all, to spend their time building movements, and to ensure that everybody, any living thing, whether it's human beings, animal life, plant life, had a place to live. And so I grew up in the movement. And so I often get asked by people, how did you get involved in this? I say, well, I didn't really get involved in it. It was imposed on me because there was never a time where I wasn't part of the movement. And I don't really see my role as changing. I share this to you because we're talking about how do we build movements and we often separate boots on the ground to people on the inside. Well, I want to tell everybody here I am in the House of Commons now because I am supported by the movement. I was funded by the movement, and I am beholden by the movement. So don't ever think that there is a separation between those that are in the House and those who have boots on the ground because we are all so important. We're one vote from electing us out. You need to hold elected officials to account. Now, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences with movements, starting when I was younger. My first big camp out was during the siege of Ganesatage. It was just indigenous people. It was a lonely, lonely time. The only allies we had were parked in a van. I don't think they were allies. I think they might have been enamored by us because they were taking lots of photos. <laughs> we were all alone. Fast forward to years later, Idol No More, a resurgent of the movement where Indigenous and non-Indigenous people came together to send a clear message to the government that they believed in reconciliation and change, that they believed that it was time to stop turning a blind eye to human rights violations directly rooted and ingrained in an aggressive resource extraction industries where we see heightened violence against Indigenous women and girls and that we were going to join together in peace and love and solidarity to send a clear message, and we did. You know, my father was a peace activist. I know that there's a lot of talk about how to spend monies, military, housing, people first. And one of the things that I learned growing up as a kid in the peace movement is that movements need to be inclusive. Movements cannot confine how people move how they use their voice from their place, wherever that place may be. They need to be based on love and respect. And they need to build something that people want to be a part of. Sometimes we talk too much about what we're fighting against instead of what we are fighting for. We need to start talking about what we are fighting for, as our good friend Emma Jackson shared prior to me coming up. We need clear goals of what we're trying to accomplish, and we need a strategy to get there. But it needs to be empower empowering and hopeful. It needs to be filled with joy. So I was sharing with a good colleague of mine with the 
apology or not really apology of the Pope today and what my thoughts were about it. And here is what I shared with my good friend. I said, here's my thoughts. They said, what do you think of it? I said, well, I don't really think it's my place to decide for somebody how they should heal and what closure means to them. And this is what I said. You know, coming from where I come from, my background, being an Indigenous person in this country, everything was put in place to strip us of our joy, to take away our human rights. The most aggressive was to steal our children. So when I was about 40 years old, I had always been brought up in the movement. I've always been part of the struggle, teaching full-time at the university, and then working in the movement, off until 2, 3 in the morning every day, because I believe that it's movements that change the world. But I was tired, and I was burnt out. And so I asked myself, why am I doing this? Why do I burn myself out? Why do I struggle? Like, even in this place, this violent colonial structure, why do I expose myself? Like, why can't I just be like everybody else and go to the mall and the spa and just be carefree and live life frivolously? And then I took a step back, and I thought, I'm fighting for the right to joy. I'm fighting for the right to joy for myself, for my son, for our planet, for our four-leggeds, and everything that was put in place. And we're talking about now the corporate elite and everyone else. Everything has been put in place to strip away our joy. So living joy, in fact, is a revolutionary act. We are at a critical juncture. We are at a time where we are in a climate catastrophe in real time. We see what we've been talking about, a growing white nationalist movement in the country. And in the midst of all of this, we see wars raging around the world on the backs of people, on the backs of our planet. We've seen fires raging in BC, a whole town lit in BC, go up in flames. And as I mourn the loss and grieve for all the people, I took a step back and thought about all the four-leggeds that were grieving the loss of their loved ones, a climate emergency. We see growing inequality. We see a normalization of violating people's human rights, picking economic interests over the human rights of people. But here's the thing. Life is not stagnant. We have the power to change it. We need to be focused in love and kindness, and it cannot be calculated. It has to be honest. It has to be truthful. It has to be bold. We, as Emma said, we need to take bold actions around climate, around human rights, around peace around the world. And if we can garner around that in an honest way with truth at the forefront, we will win. So I am not Martin Luther King. But here's the thing. We have a lot of tough choices to make as progressives in this country. And I'm going to tell you this, and it's not going to be popular. I don't think our goal should be winning. I think you win when you do the right thing. I can only think of Winnipeg Center, where I thought, I'm just going to tell the truth, and I'm going to see if it's a good political strategy. 
I think it needs to be focused. I think it needs to be bold. I think it needs to be inspiring. I think it needs to be joy driven. And then maybe, maybe we will have a chance to win. So what I want to sell you all here today, let's celebrate our learning. Let's join together. Let's celebrate the privilege that we have in this room to be joyful. And I wish you all well on your journeys home. Take care.